Uh, it's a pleasure you know, for the Flark Club to have uh, Tom Pereira on board tonight. And Tom, let me turn it over to you. Tom Pereira, W1TP. Welcome aboard, Tom. Oh, thank you very much, and greetings to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, to get a chance to talk to you. I'm going to take you back uh, into the early days when I started out in radio for just a second, uh, and then I'm going to talk about spy radio operations, a little bit about the Enigma, and some of the fantastic CIA bugs that have been developed. Um, I started out in ham radio at the age of 15. There's a picture of me and my daddy had a lot of money. <laughs> and I said, Daddy, I want a radio receiver. I want a Collins. And he said, OK, kid, go ahead and buy one. And by God, I had a Collins 75A2 as my first receiver. It was just heaven to have that kind of money. Then I went downtown to Harrison Radio. And there's a picture of Harrison Radio on Radio Row, and they had just everything in that store. Uh, picture also of another picture of Radio Row, and I said, "Mr. Harrison, I want a I want a Collins transmitter to go with my Collins 75A2." And he said, "Sorry, kid, can't sell you a transmitter. You got to build your own." That guy did more for my future than anybody could have ever done. Can you imagine? He turned down a sale for a Collins transmitter to educate me and say, okay, you got to build your own. And I did. And it was the best thing I ever did. And I went back to him to buy a Vibraplex bug. I said, I want one of those Vibraplex deluxe bugs. And he said, how fast can you send with a straight key, kid? And I said, well, I can send about 10 words a minute. And he said, well, come back when you can send 20 and I'll sell you the bug. Can you imagine that? There's a guy absolutely starting my career in ham radio uh, with a reality check. And uh, Radio Row was absolutely wonderful. I lived in the middle of New York City. I know a number of you remember that. There were just streets lined with stuff that you see on the right here. And Harrison Radio was always the go-to place for anything that you wanted. Look at the pile of used KWM1s on the right there. Just an amazing, amazing store. Um, Bob Saltzman and I are trying to put together a talk on Radio Row, and I took some movies when I was down there, but uh, we would really, really appreciate it if any of you might perhaps have a few pictures. There are a few pictures on the internet, but they aren't great. And if any of you, I know many of you were down there during those days, if any of you have pictures, it would be wonderful. Anyway, as you can see in this next picture I made, good use of Radio Row. My shack grew uh, vertically rather than horizontally. And uh, over on the left is a pair of 813 kilowatt that I built, the trusty old Collins receiver in the middle. And if you look down on the operating table there, you'll see something unbelievable. It's a Hallicrafter's Delta Delta One dual diversity receiver. And you could take two antennas and combine them with this receiver and pick the signal that came in first. Um, they didn't make many of those. They're really wonderful receivers. Um, I was already into buying and selling stuff. So uh, it, uh, I found that uh, it, this is uh, a lot of fun for a ham to have a station like this. And it's gotten worse and worse and worse as I got older and finally had to buy a farm up here in Vermont with 11 outbuildings. And I filled those outbuildings with stuff and I'm, I'm still trying to reduce it a little bit, as many of us are. So that's a little background. I'm going to take you now to spy radios, and we're going to talk about what happens when uh, a country is occupied. Here are the German soldiers coming into France, occupying France. And when they come into a, a country, the first thing they do is find quarters, places to live. And here they are taken 
people's furniture out of their apartments. They're going to move into people's apartments, and the, the, the residents are clearing their furniture out and carting them away on trucks. And this doesn't make the people very happy in an occupied country. So here we have up at the top of this little diagram the invasion, the occupation, in this case by Germans. And then we see our citizens. What do the citizens do when a country is occupied? Well, most of them, as you can well expect, don't do anything. They are the, the do-nothings, essentially, and they, they literally don't do much, and they don't contribute to the war effort one way or the other. Um, we also have the resistance, and these are people who are very angry about the occupation. They are the patriots. They try to do anything they can to get the invading soldiers out of their country. Uh, in order to do that, they are involved in spying, and often they use radios in order to gain information, get information from, in this case, the Allies about what they are doing about the war, and also to send intel or intelligence to the Allies, to let them know what's happening in country so that they can um, change their plans during the war. And unfortunately, the resistance doesn't have a lot of radio operators, trained radio operators. So they have to import them. And down below, you see the British ended up training a lot of clandestine spy radio operators and then parachuting them into the country. The third group of people are the collaborators. They look at the invaders and they say, whoa, these guys are powerful. They're going to take over our country. I better cooperate with them. I'll start spying for them and tell them about what the resistance is doing. And I'll also help them hunt for the resistance radios. So these collaborators can be really dangerous because although resistance fighters can recognize enemy soldiers, they can't recognize people from within their own country who are trying to do them in. So that's a, a major problem. Um, as we uh, go on and look at what uh, happens. The, uh, the resistance are involved in active fighting. We see these guys with machine guns fighting against the Germans. They also place bombs on railroad tracks. But their main job really is to gather intelligence. And that means taking pictures of what's going on in country and then sending those pictures to uh, the allies. Here we see a woman with a Rolleiflex in her pocketbook looking down into the viewfinder and taking pictures, which will eventually be sent back to the allies. Uh, they found early on that the Germans did not suspect women of spying. So for the most part, spies were women. Uh, in these countries because uh, somehow the Germans didn't think women would make good spies and they didn't look at them as carefully as they looked at uh, relatively young men who might be walking around. So you have uh, cameras in pocketbooks. Here's a wonderful little camera built into a cigarette lighter, which actually works. So the guy can light his cigarette, as you see in the picture on the right, and at the same time take a picture in quite a complex and good little camera. Uh, we also find that the resistance sometimes is involved in protesting. And this guy, when the Germans came into Holland and said, we're going to ration clothing, this guy said, well, OK, I'll go without. And he went walking down the street to protest the German rationing of clothing. Uh, all of this going on during an occupation. But the, one of the most important things that happened during an occupation is that the, uh, the people in the country needed to have radios to listen to what was going on. They wanted to listen to the British Broadcasting Company and listen to the activities. But if they were caught with one of these radios, they were killed. No question about it. If you have a radio in front of you, you're dead. You're shot right on the spot. So they had to be very careful about where they hid these radios. One of the typical places was in an innocent looking suitcase, maybe with some old clothing on top. But they developed some really neat places to hide radios. On the left, we see a telephone book. Down below, we see the radio that is inside the telephone book. We see the, uh, a, um, an iron up at the top. And if you pull the iron apart, you have a radio. These radios took tubes in those days. And so uh, it took a fair amount of space. And here's a, 
a furniture leg, which has been hollowed out, and the radio inside the furniture leg can be seen down at the bottom of that illustration. <clears throat> you know, photographs were a good place to hide radios. On the left, we have two normal photographs, and on the right, you see the hidden radios inside these phonographs. And other things could be pressed into service to hide radios, a brownie camera with a radio inside it, a thermos chug with a radio inside it. But by far, the most weird radio uh, was built into a dental appliance. And this made use of a very interesting physiological phenomenon, whereby if you impose <clears throat> an audio frequency signal in your mouth, you can actually hear the signal. Don't get any ideas, by the way, about hooking your speaker leads and uh, uh, putting them in your mouth because some speakers carry relatively high voltages. But it is an interesting way of, of receiving information without the need for headphones. And uh, this was sort of like a, a crystal set built into this plastic here and then hooked into the mouth in that way. The most widely used of the secret uh, spy radios, uh, clandestine radio receivers, was called the Sweetheart Radio. And these were made by the thousands by the British during the war. Consists of a radio on the left, a battery compartment on the right, and a little pair of crystal earphones. And uh, these sweetheart radios allowed people to tune into the British Broadcasting Company, find out what was happening during the war, and then react to it appropriately. You could hide a sweetheart radio inside a clock, and uh, so you could actually split the earphones of a sweetheart radio, as you see here, one in the guy's lap, and two leads, one going to an earphone for the middle guy, one going to an earphone for the right-hand guy. So you could find out and learn what was going on in the, uh, in the war by listening in with these. The Germans also had a radio and it was provided by the German government. It says, uh, listen, Deutschland, hear the Fuhrer. And this radio was called a Volksempfanger. And it was named sort of after the Volkswagen or people's car, Volkswagen. Uh, and the Volksempfanger, the Volks means people, and Empfanger is the German word for receiver. So it's the people's radio receiver. And they gave these to people at a very, very low price. And you could put one of these in your home and you could actually tune it. But there came with a red warning sticker that if you listen to any station other than the Fuhrer, you will be uh, put in prison and perhaps subject to the death penalty. So you had to be very careful uh, in order to not listen to the BBC. And if you did listen to the BBC, the Germans were really clever. They put a heterodyne frequency on all of the BBC frequencies. So you get the BBC, they would transmit an AM signal a thousand hertz off to the side of the center of the BBC frequency. And so if a person was listening to the BBC, a heterodyne would come through the speaker. And that was a giveaway that you were listening to an illegal radio station. You were listening to the BBC. And people were able to uh, actually did turn in their neighbors. If they heard the, uh, this tone coming from their neighbor's apartment or house, they would turn in their neighbor because they were able to get some benefits from the Germans if they found people who were listening to illegal stations. Well, that was all going on during the war. And at the same time, uh, spy radio operators were communicating with the Allies during the war. The nickname for these spy radio operators was pianists. They were um, operating keys, like the keys of a piano. And again, the penalty was death, but even more severe, because if you have a transmitter and not just a receiver, it's clear that you're a spy, and a spy is a, a subject to immediate uh, death sentence without any uh, pre preliminary uh, court hearings. A very good book on clandestine radio oper operators by Perquin. Um, most of many of the pictures that I'm going to show came from this book and a lot of interesting data in there. The clandestine spy radio operators were trained in England. There's a picture of the training of these people. They were then dressed in appropriate clothing. The British maintained a very elaborate 
um, uniform uh, collection that they could put on their spies, but they could also outfit them with civilian clothes uh, so that they could go in and uh, look, blend into the population fairly well. Interestingly enough, they were so desperate for spy radio operators that they did not require that the operators speak the language of the country into which they're going to be parachuted. So you didn't have to speak French to parachute into France and send secret messages back to England. Uh, here are people packing up the spy radios, and we'll be looking more closely at those in a moment. And uh, they were packed in uh, shockproof containers so that they could be dropped by parachute. And parachutes don't land gently, so you have to have a, a pretty um, well-packed spy radio. Uh, here we have the radio operators climbing into an airplane ready to do a night drop over France. And uh, finally, when they get in country, they set up their radio station and they start operating. One of the problems setting up a radio station in those days, of course, was that you're talking HF radio. You had to have a pretty good size antenna even to get back to England. And in the case of uh, setting up in the woods, you could usually throw an antenna or climb an antenna up into a tree, as you see on the left here but it was sometimes necessary to be very creative about it. Um, the uh, spy radio operators generally had a person on guard, the guy on the left with a submachine gun, and one or two operators on the right here. And you see the guy in the bushes here looking for a uh, low-flying aircraft that might be out to spot them. Another group of spies using a hand crank generator to power their radio. Um, some of the spies operated in apartments in, in the cities. Here we have a guy, you can see the antenna wire. What do you do with an antenna wire inside an apartment? The most typical thing that they found worked out well was to run the antenna wire up a chimney. And uh, it's a little difficult to, to get it up there without climbing on the roof and lowering something down, but they figured various ways of doing it. And that was the typical way of uh, running antennas. I'm rather surprised they never used very fine wire like number 40 wire, which I've used many times when I was in an area where uh, it would not be appreciated if I put up a, an antenna. Um, maybe they were afraid it wasn't durable or enough. I'm not sure. So here's a typical spy radio operator. He's got a suitcase radio and an antenna up the chimney. The average lifespan of a spy radio operator could be measured in days because there were very elaborate direction finding uh, devices that the Germans used to spot these people. Here's a woman named Phyllis Doyle, whose code name was Paulette. And on the left, you see her at age 23. Uh, she was parachuted into Normandy before the invasion. She sent back messages to the British reporting on what was going on. Somehow she survived, and you see her in her later years on the right with a bunch of medals that she earned through doing this. Here she is operating her suitcase radio and sending messages back to England. And uh, when she's done with the message, she had to hide the radio very effectively. And these radios came apart in pieces. And this one you could stuff inside a vacuum cleaner or other small uh, hiding place. <clears throat> the, uh, another example of a female radio operator, many of them were female. They were, again, parachuted into Germany uh, on the left here. And she's operating a suitcase radio you see in front of her with a telegraph key on a stand in front of her. And uh, power was always a problem uh, in the case where you couldn't plug in your radio to the wall. You had to generate power either through using vehicle batteries or a generator. And as you can see here, bicycle was hooked up to an old a vehicle generator to generate a voltage that would operate the radio. The Germans got pretty smart and they realized that if uh, an operator was operating in a city, they were probably operating on the city main voltage supply. And so they uh, figured out how to turn off the electricity to different city blocks. And when they found a block that suddenly silenced the spy radio operator, they knew that that operator was located within that city block, and they would then go out and try and find the spy radio operator um, using more direct uh, direction-finding techniques. 
the spy radio suffered from one very major drawback, and that is in order to be able to operate on multiple voltages, they had to have a huge, huge power transformer that uh, was used to step down or step up six volts, 12 volts, 24 volts, 110 volts, 220 volts. And that transformer was really heavy. And a suitcase spy radio, which is supposed to look like it has some clothing in it, turns out to be so heavy that you have to sort of lug it around, as you see this woman is doing here. Uh, and that doesn't look totally unsuspicious. Uh, if you're hauling something that heavy, it looks a little bit suspicious. If you happen to have a bicycle, however, you can put the spy radio on the back and it doesn't matter how heavy it is. Well, we'll look at the circuit of these uh, radios in a moment and see what I mean about the large transformers. Uh, clandestine spy radio sets came in many different types. They are outlined in a wonderful book by Louis Milstey and Rudolf Staritz. Um, it's called Wireless for the Warrior, and there are many volumes of this book, and it's quite expensive, $50, $60 per volume, but it covers every imaginable spy clandestine radio from countries you may have never even heard of. So it's a great reference book and it has all sorts of good things in it. Spy communications is not new. During the Civil War, there was something called a Civil War pocket telegraph spy set. And this was a device that had a sounder on the left here and a tiny little telegraph key on the right. You would take one lead from this set and jam it into the ground along with your bayonet so it made a good ground connection. You take the other lead uh, and you throw it over the enemy telegraph line. <clears throat> and since the lines were not insulated in those days, you got a very good connection. You could listen in on enemy telegraph signals right during the Civil War. And if you were good and figured you could get away with it, you could actually send false messages on the enemy telegraph lines. It's really weird because you look a lot of books on the Civil War, you really have to hunt to find any that even mention the telegraph. You look in the index and most books on Civil War don't even mention the telegraph, but Lincoln spent a lot of time in the telegraph office listening to the uh, communications from his generals and from spies who were listening in on the enemy. So that was a, an early beginning to this kind of electronic eavesdropping, uh, electrical eavesdropping in that case. Here's a British spy radio type A Mark II typical of a suitcase radio. You have the receiver in the, in the background here, the transmitter in the foreground with a, a crystal. And on the right, you see the uh, power supply. And again, that's a heavy power supply. The um, Spy Radio Mark uh, 7 Paraset was actually designed to be dropped by parachute. And as you can see, it used metal tubes and they were not plugged in when it was dropped. So it was a little more durable and uh, uh, more resistant to shock and it operated better. Here's the, the classic suitcase radio. It's the British Mark II spy radio type three. It's nicknamed the B2. And it was designed by John Brown, 6G3 EUR, G3 EUR. Uh, in the foreground here, you see the receiver, the main tuning dial is uh, right uh, in your lap there. There's a band switch on the left and the tuning indicator is above the tuning dial. In the back, you see the radio transmitter section. There's a crystal on the right uh, and pl uses plug-in coils to set the frequency. And you can you have antenna um, and uh, plate tuning condensers up here. On the right, you have this huge power supply with its great big transformer. And again, that's where the weight is. And if we look at the circuit diagram of the B2, very simple, very, very simple circuit. You see a crystal oscillator uh, feeding into a power amplifier, feeding by way of the plug-in coils into the antenna. So that's the transmitter. The receiver has a uh, RF amplifier feeding into a, uh, an IF strip and eventually into the earphones. And this is the power transformer that I was talking about. Notice all of the windings on this immense power transformer. And that's a very, very heavy transformer. So that was one of the problems with these radios. They were pretty good performers, except for that problem. 
Uh, the PRC-1 is a radio that, sub, uh, that followed the British radios. This is a radio used by our forces, the Allied forces. And uh, Mike Crestall, W1RC, who runs the uh, Nearfest Hamfest, put together a little chart that's rather helpful in identifying radios. As you see in World War II, radios typically had a preceding set of letters, SCR, which stood for Set Complete Radio, BC Basic Component, PRC Portable Radio Communication, which is what we're looking at now. And then in the 1950s, they started throwing in additional uh, designations like tactical ground and vehicular radio communications and sing cars and so on. So it's handy to have that. This is a PRC-5 used at the end of World War II, very simple little set. Interestingly enough, they put the schematic diagram right inside the lid as though the operator would be able to troubleshoot this radio uh, in the field. And they, they did that somewhat, but uh, it, it seemed unusual to have the schematic right there. Had two plug-in coils and a terrible, terrible receiver, very touchy, very difficult uh, to tune into a particular frequency. And that was a problem because you were assigned a certain frequency to transmit and receive on. And if you couldn't tune your, your receiver to that frequency, uh, you'd be lost on the band. So what they typically did was uh, they would have a low power uh, setting for the transmitter where it would transmit a signal and you could zero beat your receiver with the transmitter. And then you'd know that you were on the right frequency. Uh, the circuit diagram for this set is pretty straightforward. Again, you have a receiver up here. You have a transmitter in the lower part here, 6V6 into 6L6. And again, on the right, you see this big power transformer, which uh, allows you to operate on a number of different voltages. This is a GRC, Ground Radio Communication 109 set used by the CIA, used after typically after World War II, the transmitter in the front toward you, you can see a little telegraph key on the right, the receiver in the back, and a power supply on the left. And here's another uh, set, you can see the telegraph key sticking out of the transmitter on the right, the receiver in the middle, power supplies at various voltages on the left there, and that's the RS6 um, set of radios. Uh, there are also a bunch of experimental radios. This is a really weird one. They tried to operate a uh, scuba gear with an antenna coming up to the surface. And um, it, uh, it's obvious since none of these have ever appeared on the surplus market, nor have they ever been reported on, that this was a big failure. Uh, here's another one that you don't hear much about. We call it a, a doggy talky, I guess. If you look at this set, you see that the master has a microphone and he can talk to the dog. The really weird thing is the dog has a microphone and it can talk to the master. And I don't, I don't see how that works. <laughs> so something's going on here that I don't understand, but uh, there are pictures of this thing and uh, I, guess, uh, I guess they used it. Um, the very latest, I'm gonna jump from back in World War II right up to the absolute present. The very latest radio that is used by the Secret Service, uh, all of the, virtually all of the soldiers that you see in, in Afghanistan and any pictures of soldiers use this radio. It's a Harris RF310M and it's an enciphered radio. It has inside it the equivalent of an Enigma machine. So this is a fantastic radio. It's a little heavy. I'll show you one when I finish the talk I have in the shack here. Uh, almost impossible for a ham to get one of these. Um, they cost about $15,000 for a handy talking. So it's not something you'd really want to buy. But I, I had a very weird experience. I was set up with my enigmas at the World War II enactment, reenactment in Reading, Pennsylvania. And a guy came back by on a Sherman tank and he had one of these things in his hand. He was playing like he was a World War II tank operator and talking to people. And uh, he saw my display and I had some BC-611 World War II walkie-talkies on display. And uh, he said, now this doesn't look like a World War II walkie-talkie that I have here. You got one down there, you wanna trade? 
<laughs> in a minute, I said. Well, I didn't say it, but all of a sudden, I ended up owning this thing, and he ended up with a World War II walkie-talkie. I was very happy about this. It's very, very complex and amazing radio. That little knob you see on the top there, if you turn it all the way clockwise, it has a Z for Zulu position. And if you transmit in the Z for Zulu position, it it's wipes out every single thing in the memory of this, including the encryption par um, uh, coding system. So it, it's like self-destruct, like the uh, some of the radios that they had with a little explosive in them that would self-destruct if you use them. So it's a really neat radio. I'll show it to you later. But the thing that really blew my mind was I got on um, eBay one day, I was looking at the RF310M to see if anybody was selling one. And sure enough, there were pages and pages of these things. And uh, they didn't call it a, a Harris radio, but it has, says Harris right on it. And here they were being sold for $297, $270. And what's going on? So I looked into this a little more closely. And it turns out that all of these radios are apparently Chinese clones. And uh, the Chinese have simply put a, a, the equivalent of a two meter HT inside a case that mimics the, the Harris case, including the word Harris on the top of it. And they're selling these things openly on eBay. So it's just thought you'd enjoy seeing that. An amazing experience. The, uh, here's a picture of me with the World War II walkie-talkie on one side and the Harris radio on the other, just for fun. Uh, direction finding devices uh, were, uh, came in various types. For the most part, direction finding devices that were used by the Germans were hidden in vehicles uh, and the vehicles were pretty inconspicuous looking. This vehicle has a direction finding antenna on it. It doesn't look that suspicious. So this thing would just drive around looking for spy radio operators. And inside the vehicle, there would be a radio operator tuning the antenna manually to uh, rotate the coil uh, electrically or manually and locate a uh, spike or clandestine radio station. Here's a, another picture inside one of these vans locating the uh, station. And of course, direction finding is done by having two separate receivers at different locations, and each receiver gets a bearing on the sending station, which is in the middle here. And if you then plot the two bearings on a map, the place where they cross is the place where the spy radio operator is located. Um, the Feisler Storch, a very, very slow flying aircraft, was also mounted with these antennas. And they were pretty good at locating people. You could locate a, a spy within a city block or so. And then you would then go out on foot to try and track down the station a little more accurately. And here we see a suitcase mounted direction finding receiver. And the receiver is inside the suitcase couple of controls that can be operated by your hand as you hold the suitcase. And you can use that to zero in on a spy radio. Here's a picture of a German Gestapo operator listening for spy radio sets. And he is wearing a body-worn direction finder. And it doesn't look like much. It doesn't look like he has a radio in there. But if we get him to do a flashing act and show us what is under his raincoat, we see sure enough, he has a radio transmitter strapped around his waist. And if you follow the antenna lead, you'll see the antennas go out into his arms. And so he can simply orient his body and get a no to locate the uh, radio station. But how can he tell when he has a no when he has this uh, overcoat on? Well, if you look at his wrist carefully, you'll notice that he's wearing a wristwatch. And the wristwatch is really a signal strength meter. And that little dial that you see there will move over and indicate the strength of the signal. So all he has to do is look down at his watch as though he was checking the time and swing his arms around a little bit and find a null. And then he knows that his body is directly in line 
with the spy radio station. Then he walks somewhere else, gets a different bearing, and he can zero in very closely on the spy station. So that's one of the techniques. And with all of that going on, how are you going to get away with transmitting if you're going to be caught as soon as you go on the air? And one of the techniques is to use very, very short transmissions that don't give the spy, the um, DF operator, direction finding operator, a chance to zero in on your signal. And this is one of the simplest of the burst encoders that allow you to send messages very fast. You use a stylus and you simply move the stylus down along this vertical column under the letter you want to send and you move it very fast. And on the left, you see the letter A. There's a little copper terminal right in there for the dot and a wider copper strip for the dash. So A comes out dot dash. And the faster you move the stylus, the more rapidly it sends that. And it doesn't give the direction finders much of a chance to zero in on you. Later in the Cold War, the Russians did a similar thing. Uh, although this device allows three different kinds of transmission. On the right, you see a device that punches holes in a 35 millimeter film. And on the left, you see a film reader and you crank the handle and you pull this film through very, very fast and it sends, connects to the transmitter and sends Morse code very rapidly. If for some reason you want to manually key it, there's a manual key in the front of this device. And if you want to use this burst encoding stylus, you'll notice that the top of the encoder has a set of uh, numbers on it from zero through, from one through zero, and that allows you to send numbers. And you then simply have a number represent, two numbers represent a letter of the alphabet, and you can send messages very quickly that way. So these are some of the techniques that spies use for encoding messages. They also enciphered their messages. No spy could carry an Enigma machine around. They weigh as much as a spy radio, and they're very clumsy, and they're also very hard to set up. So spies never used Enigma machines. They used a hand encoding device where they would take a, a piece of text. It's called a one-time pad. And they would have this little pad that was the key to their encoded message. And they would never reuse that. Both the transmitting and receiving station would have that pad. And once it was used once, it would be destroyed. And it's almost impossible to decipher that. This is how an encoded message would be sent. And uh, it sometimes would be transmitted or uh, carried, hand carried over to England in various hiding places like this walnut shell. Enigmas were used, of course, during World War II. And the enigmas were deciphered by Polish mathematicians about six years before World War II even started, long before the British had anything to do with it. And when Poland was overrun, the British took over, the Poles taught the British how to decipher the messages, the British took over and deciphered the messages for the rest of the war. And so when any time that the Germans used enigmas, the messages, if they were sent by radio, could be deciphered. And the German spy controllers used enigmas to keep track of their spies. They would say, well, I've got, I've got a spy on First Street in London in the third, um, on the third floor, and that would be rogered by someone else. But they didn't realize that they were basically giving away the location of these people that they had infiltrated into England. Same thing in America. The Germans uh, often talked about the location of their spies. And that allowed the British and the Americans to catch spies because the Enigma messages were being intercepted. Anytime an Enigma message was sent by anybody in the German military, they were intercepted by the Allies. Numerous receivers were set up and the messages were then decoded and they revealed the location of the spy radio operators. Here's an example of a code wheel used by double agent Tate. Double agent Tate was originally a German spy who was landed from a submarine in England along with his radio transmitter and a very simple kind of encoding device. He was unveiled 
because one of his spy masters talked about his location. He was then picked up by the British and it is believed that the British managed to pick up every single German spy that was ever landed on the British coast because of their locations being given away. And Tate was given the typical choice. You have two choices. One, you can refuse to cooperate with us and we will hang you immediately. Two, you can cooperate with us and send secret messages back to your spy masters in Germany and tell them the things that we will tell you. Well, Tate wasn't an idiot. And so he said, okay, okay, I'll become a, a double agent. And he sent messages back to Germany. It would surprise me to learn that quite a number of German operators, spy operators, chose death over cooperating with the Allies. So quite a number of them were actually put to death. This also applied to America. And uh, here's a picture of a German operator who had set up in New York City with a typical rather classic looking ham radio station. You see the helicopter receiver on the right, the helicopter speaker. If you look down below, you'll see a battery used for power because he knew about the, the possibility of turning off the electricity for a city block to, to locate a spy. And he has his pet dog on the right. And uh, he was simply located by the neighbors getting uh, suspicious about this guy. He just looked suspicious and they turned him into the FBI and they went and raided his apartment. His apartment is up beautifully located on the top of an apartment building in New York City. So he had great antenna location. They used uh, wire antennas that were completely out of sight of anybody on the ground. And he was executed uh, after he was found. At the end of the war, uh, the radios were given back to people and everybody was happy. They got their radios back. Uh, they were not restricted in what they could listen to and the war was over. So uh, that's my story on spies and spy radios and the enigma. I'm gonna move on immediately to talking about the Cold War and CIA bugs. And a lot of this information was dug up by Paul Rubers and Mark Simons, who have a very wonderful website uh, with all this kind of information uh, in it. And uh, the, the website is cryptomuseum.com. So a lot of the pictures and the information comes from them, but I think it's interesting enough so that you'll find it worth listening to and, and looking at. Um, the types of spy uh, bugs that the uh, Russians used during the Cold War varied a lot. Most typically, the wristwatch was used quite widely, wristwatch with a microphone lead going into a tape recorder. And then there were radio transmitting bugs. And this is a typical radio transmitting bug that you would use to uh, pick up sounds in a room. This one is hidden inside a necktie and the antenna goes around the neck of the necktie, the neck band. And the big drawback on this kind of bugs is that they have to have a battery to power them. But nevertheless, if you're going into a room, you want to record everything in the room, it's a neat way to do it. Uh, here's a picture of a CIA bug in a pen, about 10 years old or so. And you can actually see the whole uh, operation of this device. This is a, uh, an X-ray view, basically. The batteries are on the left. The microphone is visible next. Then we have a couple of transistors in the transmitter, an FM transmitter. And way over on the right, we see the antenna coil and a little stubby antenna that's coupled to the metal on the pen. So that's a typical bug that you would find inside a pen. Nowadays, not only can you have a bug inside a pen, you can have a video camera inside of a pen, but this was an early version uh, working toward that. Uh, the Russians used telephone taps quite widely, and they hid these telephone taps inside a little box that says signal conditioning box. And uh, so a, a telephone uh, repairman would show up and say, I need to work on your a telephone line in the basement. I need to put in a box because uh, we're, we're showing signals that your phone isn't working well. And so a guy goes down there, installs this thing, and it's really a a phone tap using 
capacitive coupling so that you can't tell that there's a phone tap on the line. And then there are a couple of terminals here that can be fed out to a radio transmitter or to a tape recorder or through very fine wire through the wall to another room in a house. A KGB bug came in many different styles and shapes as we'll see, this is perhaps the simplest where you take a free running oscillator and you use a crystal microphone that's coupled directly, connected directly into the tank circuit of this free running oscillator so that any sound that's picked up by the microphone modulates the frequency of this transmitter oscillator. And that is then radiated through an antenna and the uh, power comes from a separate battery. So it's a fairly basic rudimentary kind of bug. Uh, easily detected because it's a constant frequency. And if you do a sweep for a bug, you find a signal on that frequency. This is the circuit diagram for it. Very straightforward transistor oscillator and transistor amplifier. Bugs were inserted into all kinds of devices and places. This is a, a bug inside an IBM Selectric typewriter. And there are just a, a very large number of different bugs. Uh, Paul and Mark have uh, put them together in this little chart here, all kinds of bugs. And it's interesting to look at them. They all have different names. They all have different capabilities. They represent the state of the art as the art changed during the Cold War. The bug detectors that were developed to deal with them are rather interesting to look at. Obviously, the, the basic bug can be detected by a basic receiver, which uh, sweeps a wide range of frequencies. And that is exemplified by this Tesla MRP4. This is a portable bug locating device, which is capable of locating radar signals and impulse transmissions and voice transmissions. And it's also capable of doing some direction finding. It's a very directional antenna. It's a very simple device. It has two antennas, one for a lower frequency range, one for a higher frequency range. And the circuit diagram is extremely simple, as you can see. Each of the antennas feed into basically a, just a plain old diode. The diode is fed into an audio amplifier and the amplifier is fed into either a meter indicator on the front of the device or into a loudspeaker uh, or earphones for the operator. The operator can look pretty uh, innocent. Here's a, a really sneaky looking uh, guy walking around. The only obvious thing is he got a pair of earphones in his ears, but the MRP is not totally uh, obvious on his chest here, although he is looking pretty, pretty strange. Well, uh, and if you do a flashing act, again, you see the MRP3 that he's walking around with. And again, all he has to do is point his body at a radio source or a suspected bug and listen or look at the meter to determine whether it's there. Here's a somewhat simpler but wider range device. It has plug-in coils on the back, handheld loop antenna, and you walk around with this thing, it's not quite as incongruous and incognito as the other device. Um, of course, when people started hunting for bugs, other people decided, uh, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna jam any possible bugs by inserting a very, very high level radio signal into the room. If we can't find the bug, we're gonna jam any radio signals that might be radiated within this room. And so they impose a big jamming signal on a given room. And then, of course, as, as the technology evolved, different techniques were designed to deal with it. The technique that dealt with this problem was a differential bug detector. A differential receiver is a very neat device where if a signal comes in simultaneously and equal power to both of the antennas, it is canceled out. But if the signal comes in more strongly to one antenna than into another, it is amplified. So you can use this device to block out jamming because the jamming comes into both of the antennas at the same time, while at the same time picking up the intelligence from the bug. So neat devices. And again, Paul and Mark have a long 
tables showing all of the direction finding and bug locating devices that have been uh, developed over the years, especially during the Cold War. The CIA also in the 1970s developed a very, very tiny drone and uh, they flew this thing. You can see the, the wings of this bug uh, flap uh, electrically and the tail of the drone is a microphone. So they could fly this thing through a room and pick up any conversations in the room. <laughs> the only trouble was the darn thing made noises that didn't sound a whole lot like a uh, dragonfly. And so it wasn't a very successful thing. And the CIA pretty much gave up on their insectothopter technique. But then amazingly in 2017, it was revealed that they had actually mounted a bug on a live dragonfly and turned it into a kind of a drone. And if you look at this poor little dragonfly, it's got a radio transmitter on it, it's got a microphone, it's got an antenna hanging out the back, <laughs> and this guy's got to fly around a room. And so they experimented with this. I don't know whether they're still using these or not, but it's a, a pretty amazing little device. So now we move on to some of the really interesting technology that developed in 1945 for listening in a room. And this started out with the Great Seal of the United States, which was given by the Russians to the Americans when the Americans built a new American embassy in Moscow. The seal was put on the wall of the room of course, it was swept by bug detectors to see if it had a transmitter inside it. It didn't. It was donated in 1945 by the Russians to the American. It was not until 1952 that the Americans found out that it was rebroadcasting everything that was being said in that room. And I think they were so embarrassed by it taking that long to find it that it was not until 1960 that they publicly admitted or uh, complained that the Russians had bugged their embassy with this device. Now, how do you get away with bugging a room without a radio transmitter? So you look inside this device and you see that there's a little tiny rod that runs down the middle of the device. There's a little round thing in the very middle, but there are no batteries, there's no radio equipment. What's going on here? And they took the bug apart and they found, after complaining, of course, hey, the Russians bugged our embassy, look at this thing. And they, they publicly brought it out. But then they, they started analyzing this device. Uh, Reagan suspended construction of a new embassy and so on and so forth, a lot of politics around it. When they think apart, they found that it consisted of a very, very simple little round cylinder and a antenna-like device. And, uh, if we look at this rather carefully, we see that the uh, round cylinder consists of a little tuning post. It's all metal, nothing electronic, little tuning post in the middle there and a membrane, and then a, um, a little soft device and a, an air inlet. So what happened is any sound that came in would cause this metal membrane to vibrate back and forth in front of this post. And the vibration, the electrical signal from that vibration would be carried out through the antenna. But how could that be done? Well, the answer ultimately was, that it is a totally passive device. And in order to operate it, you have to transmit a signal that energizes the antenna and gets it to resonate at a particular frequency. And that then is modified. The resonant frequency of the antenna is modified by the diaphragm picking up audio signals. And that modified frequency is rebroadcast out to a receiver that then can detect the modification, the modulation, and tell what was being said in the room. So a very, very clever device, nicknamed this thing Easy Chair. They always had to have a code name for it. And you can see that the, uh, the basic Easy Chair requires a transmitter sending out a signal that ultimately imposes itself on the antenna-like device 
and a receiver uh, which picks up the changed frequency of the rebroadcasted signal. Uh, the first generation easy chair then had a microphone, second generation and so on, actually put a diode in place and use the diode in the antenna element to rectify the imposed transmitted signal and use that rectified signal to actually power a high gain microphone amplifier. So it was a, an evolution of the bug in which it used this imposed voltage to produce a higher gain amplifier and be able to listen to quieter signal. Here's a picture of the device with the diode in place. You can see a picture of the diode and connections to the device. Ultimately, the, um, the uh, package that uh, powered it, the uh, high gain audio amplifier. And uh, that all led to uh, an understanding of the device. The CIA understood how the device worked the original device, and they started building their own. And in 1958, shortly after, a few years after they had discovered the bug in their embassy, they decided, well, we're going to bug the Russian embassy. And here's the Russian embassy over on the left. They're interested in um, determining what was being said in the rooms within the circle on the left. And they were going to do this from their building, uh, allied building on the right. The um, way they were going to do this was to insert a bug into a desk. And they uh, somehow managed to get this desk into that room. And into the leg of the desk, they arranged to uh, put a, uh, a, a microphone and one of these devices. Uh, so you had the microphone up at the top modulating the device which was inside the leg of the desk. And so that was all in place. And here's the layout. The, uh, the Russian embassy is over on the right. 125 meters away is the building that contains the transmitter and receiver that's going to energize the bug in 1958. This is a picture of the location of the transmitter that's going to energize the bug up a flight of stairs and out through a window. So this window was used to blast a high current, high uh, power RF signal uh, over to the embassy and uh, into the embassy. And if you look at the actual effective radiated power, you find that it was a 500 watt transmitter using a very high gain antenna that ultimately they were bombarding the Russian embassy with 10 kilowatts of effective radiated power in order to be able to determine what was being said in that room. So it's a very neat technique, no batteries required, no electronics, just a passive element. And if you want, you can have the, the amplifier in there to increase your mic gain, but it's not absolutely critical. I thought you'd be interested in seeing this technology. When you think about it a little bit, it relates to what we have now come to call the Havana syndrome. In 2016, US dupl diplomats and CIA officials who were posted in China and Cuba uh, began to complain about all sorts of physiological symptoms, including dizziness and memory loss and nausea, vertigo, headaches, uh, and uh, tinnitus. At first, everybody thought they were malingering. They just uh, wanted to get some free medical care or something. But a lot of them have been reporting this over the years. And so finally, in 2020, the um, journal Science, which sort of tries to keep up with the very latest in both politics and uh, medical research and so on, reported that the National Academy of Sciences concluded that it was pulsed high energy radio waves that probably caused the Havana syndrome. And after this talk, I think you will now recognize where those high energy radio waves, pulsed radio waves probably came from. And that is obviously maybe Russian or uh, other transmitters that were trying to listen into rooms in these embassies. So with that, I'm going to stop talking about this and answer any questions that you may have. Be happy to do that. So I'm going to stop sharing at this point. And uh, if you have 
any questions, please feel free to ask them over and out. Okay, thanks, Tom. So who has questions? Let's just sort of open the mics uh, and, and take questions from there. I know I've got one on the board here, Tom, okay? And it's from N2AXX, who's asking, uh, actually a really interesting question regarding early number stations, which obviously had, I think, a spy theme to them. Um, you know, what sort of started the early number stations? A any idea regarding the types of receivers that were used at the time? Um, there's a tremendous amount of interest in that, and there are websites devoted to it. As far as I can tell, there is no final ultimate decision. Bob Saltzman, who's with us, has done some work on that. If you care to, to mention anything that would be useful, I don't, I don't have an answer beyond the fact that you can look on the web. Bob, are you still here? Um, I am. I don't think I have additional information that would satisfy the question that was asked and confirm all that you said. Number stations are still in use today. It appears that the encoding of the numbers is probably using the simple but very, very difficult, if almost impossible, decrypt one-time pad that Tom referred to earlier in his presentation. Uh, if there is interest, I can post some URLs or send them to Ed for distribution to members of the club. I have a collection of about 150 different types of uh, number station transmissions, all of which are intriguing in their own right. Yeah, thanks, Bob. I give you one. I guess one follow-up too is that you know there's a lot of uh, SWLs uh, who still report a lot of activity regarding number stations. Any idea where they're so coming from? Is it North Korea or any or subject or to the war operation? No, any idea, guys? Be disposed to discuss such an operation if it did in yeah, fact. Yeah, the answer exist. is yes. <laughs> <laughs> to, to the I can't rephrase it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the I guess Cuba, certainly countries in which intelligence over RF communications uh, is still prevalent is just an ongoing phenomenon. I don't think it's it'll ever stop because people need to communicate about their uh, spying activities. Great. Other questions for Tom? Yeah, I have one. Sure, go ahead. Who okay. is it? It's uh, W2NZ. W2NZ, okay. Regarding the Russian passive device, did they ever figure out what the location was, approximately how much energy they would need to activate it? Well, as I said, they, uh, they used power that I had listed there, so that, that gave them an idea of the amount of power they needed. It would seem like a total no-brainer to use direction finding to find the location of the source. But I think they were so caught by surprise by this, they didn't expect it for a number of years. They didn't even connect the symptoms with that high energy radiation. I think now, if it were to happen, uh, you would probably have a team with a direction finder like the Tesla that I showed out there immediately trying to pinpoint where it was coming from. But uh, it's only very, very recently that they've managed to connect the physiological symptoms with the possibility that they come from high energy radiation. Of course, um, the interest in high radiation, it radiated energy in involves us all tremendously. And as you know, FCC has uh, required that all of our stations have a log of what we have done to measure or determine the amount of radiation that we are generating in our stations. So people are gradually realizing that this is an important thing to look at. The other aspect of this, it leads back to all kinds of other questions. Is it unsafe to live under power lines? Do radio, um, do cell phones really irradiate your brain? Uh, how about power meters that are pulled by a central station and are transmitting on your house and so on? To answer those kinds of questions, when I was still a professor at Montclair State before I retired, I took five rats and I wrapped each of their cages with a thousand turns of wire and plugged it into 110 volts. And I took five other rats and I wrapped their cages with wire but never plugged them in. That was my control group. And I figured, man, you can't get much more uh, 
contact with radiation than wrapping a thousand turns of wire and putting 110 volts through it. And so then I studied the rats that had had the radiation and that hadn't by teaching them typical rat things to do, press a bar to get food and so on, by seeing whether they died prematurely, uh, how much they ate and whether they gained weight or anything. I could not find any absolutely no difference between the two. So I, I figure that living near a power line is probably pretty safe. Higher frequencies, we, we don't have that kind of research for, but somebody should have done that research for ham frequency. Anybody have spare rats? <laughs> <laughs> so, Tom, Sorry, Tom I, I've got a question. I, I, uh, couldn't, you know, I couldn't resist. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'm trying to, I'm trying to read the scroll here. So uh, how, first, how is it possible that a 10 kilowatt signal could not be detected by bug sweepers uh, or by simple interference, or would they just be by simple, would they, or would they just be uh, overwhelmed by the power since they would be looking for very low power signals? Uh, next, you know, I, I see the ubiquitous D battery in so many of the World War II era radios. I know battery technology was not all that great back then. I'm wondering how, you know, how were they replaced? It seems to me that buying a lot of batteries at a time when radios were pretty rare would raise all sorts of flags. Okay, and, and also thanks for a great presentation. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can do that. The batteries were supplied. Uh, there were lots of batteries available like the BC611 handy talkies. There were great many batteries um, supplied by the allies. They knew it was a problem. They had to be able to get it. They didn't buy them. They got them through whatever channels they got, guns and other things. For the, uh, the transmitter, I think that people were so caught blindsided by the the problem that they didn't think to, to look for a transmitter. But your question is, is very well taken. Uh, when you sweep a room for bugs, if there's a 10 kilowatt transmitter nearby, it's gonna blow your sweeper right out of the water. And I don't know the answer to that, um, why they didn't determine that something was going on, but they didn't. The facts are that CIA swept for bugs um, from 1945 to 1952. And it wasn't until 52 that they found this device. So uh, maybe one possibility, it's far fetched, but, but possible. Maybe just they just thought it was a local broadcast station that they were getting. It clearly wasn't modulated by voice or anything. I, I'm guessing at it. I don't know the answer. Other questions for Tom? Unmute yourself if you can, okay? Yeah, Steve uh, WX2S here. Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, you've heard of any, you know, the Russian bug, it took, what, like six years before they figured out how that worked. If, uh, if there are any bugs that have been uh, found that they still haven't figured out what the, uh, how they operated. Well, I can't answer that for sure because uh, they're going to hide all that stuff in secrecy. Paul and Mark are really great detectives, and they find out that kind of stuff. They uh, they discovered a lot of things that were not common knowledge, and so I can't really answer it because um, it's not common knowledge, and it's not it's not in Paul and Mark's website. So <laughs> that leaves me in the dark. I'm afraid. Sorry, I can't help on that one. Okay, probably an unfair question. Thank you. This is a Jim W2KNG. Thanks for the talk very well. I wonder if you could simply and quickly, 10 seconds or less, what was the theory behind the Enigma machine? I haven't figured the Enigma machine. The Germans thought it was unbreakable. I know it was a random number generator, but what, what was the theory? How did that work? What was the point of that random number generator and how did that decoded at the, at the submarine itself? I never understood that. Well, do I do I have time Ed, to do, to go into that? Yeah, I might take a few minutes. That's fine. Hmm? Okay. Now, since you asked, <laughs> I'm going to uh, bring out an Enigma machine and just explain it by showing you. I've got one in the background here. Aren't Ooh. we glad we stayed with this, right? That's oh, great. Man, they are heavy. Oh, oh, oh. That's why spies didn't carry them around. <laughs> they are very heavy machines. Uh, so I've set it up here, and I think I can get a camera on it quickly. 
and show you very simply the technology of the Enigma. And I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed because what we're going to see is that the Enigma machine is basically nothing more complicated than a flashlight. And um, let's see if I can get it to come up here. Yeah, there it is. Thanks for doing this, Tom. So yeah, perfect. yeah, no problem. Um, picture a flashlight, okay? What's in a flashlight? You've got a switch to turn on a circuit that has a battery and a light bulb in it. And that's, that's all there is to a flashlight. You turn on a switch and a light bulb lights up. Well, watch this. I press a key on the Enigma and a light bulb lights up. Can you see that little letter yes. mm -hmm. over there lighting up? So yes. the technology mm -hmm. of an Enigma machine couldn't be much simpler electrically. It's just literally a flashlight. Now, how do we use an Enigma machine to encode a message uh, so that the enemy can't decode it? And then how do we decode it? So I'm gonna do that for you. I'm going to encode mm -hmm two letters, T and T, and see what light bulbs light up when I do that. So I'm pressing the letter T once, and the letter S lights up, S for sugar. And I'm gonna push T again, and the letter P lights up. So sugar papa is the secret coded, enigma coded version of TT. Got that? Very simple. The Enigma has coded TT into Sugar Papa. Now, Sugar Papa doesn't mean anything to anybody. And so you take that Sugar Papa and you transmit it by radio or you carry it by messenger over to another Enigma machine. And you say, okay, Enigma machine, decode Sugar Papa back to TT for me. And the trick is you got to set that other Enigma machine back to the setting that this Enigma machine started with. It's called the day's key, the first setting of the Enigma. And I just did that. The only thing that happens when you type in a letter is this rotor goes click, click, and it happened twice. Now, I'm going to type in S, sugar, and see if we get T back. Sugar, the T lights up. Now I'm gonna type in the letter P for Papa and the T lights up, okay? So we have encoded the letters T and T into Sugar Papa. We've decoded Sugar Papa back into T and T. Pretty straightforward so far, right? The only biggie, and it's a biggie, it's really, it's bigger than your mind can get, grasp. The biggie is that there are 10 to the 114 power possible initial settings of an enigma. That's all there is, 10 to the 114. There are only 10 to the 80th power atoms in the entire observable universe. So the Germans had a machine that could be set in any one of 10 to the 114th power different initial day's keys. And there's no way the allies could have figured out what, which one of the 10 to the 114th power initial settings was being used, right? Now, you can quite reasonably ask me, how can you get 10 to the 114th power different settings of a dumb machine like this that's basically just a flashlight? And the answer is, first of all, look at the front here. That's a plug board panel. And there are a total of 13 sockets, actually 26 different sockets. And each of those sockets can be connected by a jumper wire. And we got a lot of jumper wires here, but the trick is that you don't have to connect any of them. That would be zero sockets connected. You could have one jumper wire, two jumper wires, up to 13 jumper wires, and they could be connecting any one of these sockets to any other socket. And the possibilities right there are immense, huge number of possibilities. 
But that isn't all that goes into the day's key. So when you set an enigma for a given day, you got to decide where the jumpers are. Next thing you got to decide is you got to open up your enigma and you got to take out the rotors, which are back here, take them right out and shuffle them around. You've got to know which of the rotors is going to go in this position, which in this position. So they just, you can put them on and off the shaft at will. That's another very part of the day's key. Every rotor has an internal setting where it can be set anywhere from zero to 26, uh, one to 26. So that's another huge number. And finally, uh, the bottom line is which of the letters on the rotors do you see in the window up here when you start out your day? So that's how you get to the 10 114th power different settings. And the uh, Nazis knew that it was impossible for the allies to figure out what the day's key was for a given day, even though the Nazis circulated a code book to all Enigma stations saying what the day's key was, it was done under great secrecy and they were closely guarded. So that meant that Dönitz with all his submarines felt absolutely safe in demanding that his submarine commanders send back to him their exact latitude and longitude every day of the war. Can you imagine what a dummy he was having his submarines send back their GPS coordinates, basically their latitude, longitude every day. And that gave away the information to the allies. The big problem was the allies couldn't sink every submarine because if they had, the Germans would have said, uh-oh, they're reading our code. And they would have thrown out their Enigma machines and done something worse. I hope that that answers the question a little bit. And I apologize for getting carried away there. It yeah, is absolutely great. Is it just I, I, I understand it. Thank you. Yeah. One or, one or two final questions. Okay. Does anyone else yeah. have any other questions? Uh, is it basically come down to it's just a bunch of switches inside there that switch things around? Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely correct. They're just a bunch of literally leaf switches under the keys, and that's all. There's nothing, nothing mysterious. A lot of people think the ah, the Enigma hooks up to a transmitter or wired sends message or something. Oh, it doesn't. All it does is light a light bulb. <laughs> Ridiculous. Well, after you after you press each key, the rotors rotate one step, don't they? That also is a big part of the encoding process. Yeah, every rotor has different internal wiring and every step, every rotor that steps changes the overall wiring of the machine. That's what happened. And the road, the problem is the rotors are really simple in their operation, just like the odometer in a car. The right hand rotor rotates 26 times and at some point it kicks over the next rotor to the left, which after it's rotated 26 times, kicks the next one over. A very simple set of rotation. The one thing that the Enigma machine designers did that helped the allies or the Poles crack the code was that you cannot encode a, a letter as itself. So no matter how many times I press that T key, it never could have come up T. <laughs> one one last question, if anyone has one. Okay, Van, a comment? Okay, and go ahead, Van. Well, this is Van, W2DLT. Tom, thank you so much. This has been well worth waiting for. <laughs> it took a while to, to pin you down, but doggone, this was just absolutely amazing. I learned so much in, in the last hour that uh, I couldn't, couldn't have read in the history books. Thanks. There you go. So uh, thank yeah. you for your thank you for your patience, Van. I know you were actually, <laughs> it just uh, it ended up being too long a trip to come down there from my my mountains up here. But uh, well, what a yeah, great yeah. group! And we I, we tracked him down in Middlebury, so that was great. Well, so. Hope you'll have me back to talk about Enigma someday. You bet. So yeah, yeah and also just you know one last notation as well too. If you check your chat, WB two ARK put up patient a link uh, regarding number stations. So Tom, on behalf of the club, uh, this was just, you know, as, as one member mentioned, this was a mesmerizing presentation. <laughs> just 
you know, if that's this another is, word for sleep. <laughs> there you go. So it's just really great to have you. Uh, good to see a face from home. So uh, oh, uh, for a great you, presentation. Guys. So good. Tom, uh, great to have you tonight. Marvelous presentation. Can't thank you enough, my friend. So 73 is for everybody. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you from W2ABE, Tom. Take Talk care. Thank you all. Thank you, Tom. Take care, Tom. Thank 73. You a lot. Sign it off.